Hello. Welcome to another episode of CXO Talk. And this, I believe, is about episode number 30, mm -hmm. or maybe number 28. Actually, they're telling me it's 29. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 29 <laughs> of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and I am here with the amazing Bala Offshore. Bala. <laughs> Michael, great seeing you on episode number 29. And, <laughs> and, and our guest today is Mike Capone, who is the CIO of one of the, the, the oldest cloud providers. Hi, Mike. Hey, Michael. How are you? Hi, Bala. Hi, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I can't. They haven't figured this part out yet. I can't shake hands through the, the camera. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what we're going to do next. Augmented reality. <laughs> so, so, Vala, it's really true. ADP is this huge company that people don't realize is one of the very first cloud providers. Absolutely. In fact, we're looking forward to Mike talking about the innovation and, and not just cloud, but the earliest adopters of the true definition of, of, a, of a cloud, uh, you know, and, and multi-tenancy and all the good good stuff that I think our technical audience will benefit from listening listening to. So, so Mike, uh, tell us about your background just briefly, and then please describe ADP, which is a huge company that many people have not even heard of. I think many business people have, but, but consumers certainly haven't. Sure, so um, absolutely. Uh, so just about me, uh, briefly. I'm a rare breed, 25 years in, in the same company, so I've been with ADP going back to 1988, but not always in IT. So um, I've done a few tours around the business, everything from finance to HR. Uh, my last gig before becoming CIO, I was actually uh, general manager of Anner Global uh, HR payroll outsourcing business, and then CIO about five years ago uh, with the, the promise you know, to the, the, the CEO at the time that I could bring kind of the technology and the business piece together. Um, ADP, um, yeah, I mean, good, good description. It's uh, you know, our, our tagline for a long time is the business behind the business. Um, we were quietly uh, moving along, 60-year history of being a very successful company, um, and obviously everybody knows us as uh, as the world's largest payroll provider, which is true. We're very proud of that fact, but we're actually the world's largest human capital management company, um, all in, meaning that we we also happen to have more HR clients than anybody more. Uh, time and labor clients than anybody. So we offer a full suite of HR services, and yes, they're all cloud-based. And um, I just came back, Mike, from uh, Interop New York, where John Chambers and some of the key uh, uh, executives talked about not just networking infrastructure and 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 the plumbing of of business, but they had specific tracks focused on the business of IT, and, and the tagline was, when IT leads, business succeeds. So talk a little, uh, to, to us a little bit about what your roles and responsibilities as a CIO, and I love the fact that you, you, know, you, you came from different lines of business into, into, into now uh, re responsible for, for global IT operations at, at ADP. Yeah, so I have the greatest job in the world um, because I do, I am the CIO, so I do have all the classic responsibilities of a CIO, including um, IT operations, data centers, networks, all the internal systems that run the enterprise, and, you know, we're an 11, uh, close to $11 billion uh, company with 60,000 employees, so, you know, important stuff going on there. But I also have responsibility for all of our product development, so all of our HR product uh, innovation comes out of my organization as well. So I get to build it, and then I also get to use it. Um, but I also have a good perspective as both a producer and a consumer of, of cloud technology. And, you know, I always start out my conversations uh, probably the same way uh, John Chambers would start out. Um, if you're a CIO today, um, and when I talk to large groups of CIOs, I say this, so it's a little controversial, but I've said it before. If you're a CIO today and you count um, your worth, you, you measure yourself based on how big your IT budget is, how many servers you have, how many people you have probably already dead, you just don't know it um, in terms of today's world. Um, that's not how, how technologists and CIOs get measured today. They get measured on outcomes and really um, being part of the business, not working with the business, but being the business, understanding what problems um, you're trying to solve, what outcomes you're trying to drive, and then coming up with the best solution for that, which very often has nothing to do with your data center and your network. It has to do with um, what the right solution is, be a cloud or internal um, 
for your organization. So Mike, let me let me just make sure that I understood this correctly. You just said that if you're a CIO today who measures his or her self his or her worth based on IT budget, you are already dead. That's what I said. That's a powerful statement. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. Yeah, so, the, tweet, the tweets are rolling in already. I can see. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of trying to get tweets out here, too. Don't worry. It's going out. So, uh, <laughs> yes, well, Vala, see, as, I, as, as everybody who listens knows, see, Vala is a machine. No, I'm just and he can tweet while he talks. See, I need to, like, think and talk, and then but he, he just does it. But so, so Mike, uh, when you talk about outcomes, that is, is it shifts into a very large kind of gray area for a CIO who wants to add value to the business. Certainly, uh, IT budget is a very simple measure. How do you measure outcomes? How do you how do you how do you measure the worth of IP of, of IT? Uh, so I'm a big believer, you know, having come from an operating job, so I spent, I spent a number of years, you know, running a large, um, a large business. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, IT's metrics has to be the business metrics. Um, so a lot of classic measurements around uptime and SLAs, those are all important and you have to have them. But, you know, when I talk to CIOs, even when I interview senior IT people, um, when they start telling me I implemented this system or that system, it's, it's like, I, I don't really care. What I want to know is, you know, I improved top line growth by X, I improve bottom line uh, profitability by Y, I reduce you know, calls into our call center by X. Um, how you did that, maybe you implemented a, a new system um, or you did something in the cloud, um, those, are, you know, those are means to an end, but the, the actual measurement has to be how you contributed to the overall success in the operating metrics of the business. When you were involved in IT five years ago, did you have the right mindset and skill set in the organization with the proper balance of business acumen and technology expertise, or did you have to, you know, shape the culture of the IT organization? You know, Val, I think it was, I think it was there. I think it was just unexpressed. I think, you know, it, it had gone into that, you know, kind of reactive mode. Uh, but I did, once I started turning over the rocks and saying, look, this is how we need to think about things. Let's, let's focus on the outcome. Um, the organization took to it really quickly, and the, the culture change wasn't that hard. Within, call it 12 to 18 months, we had everybody singing off the same hymnal in terms of business Excellent. outcomes and what we're trying to drive. Excellent. And did you, was it a was it an easier transition for you or transformation, given the fact that you had such deep institutional knowledge and expertise across multiple lines of business? Was that was that? I mean, you understood the language of the business already, and now needed to prob perhaps properly align IT resources and mindset to think enablement of business. I remember we had Mark McDonald, Group Vice President at, from Gartner, and he said if there's only one question CIOs should ask is, how will this tech investment help improve the company and delight our customers? And I thought that was pretty sound logic. It is, and, and I always make a you know big commercial for IT people um, to take a tour outside of IT because it was it, for me it was the best thing I ever did. I can't honestly imagine being a successful CIO while having left IT for a while and become a, an operational leader. Um, certainly, the credibility, you know, being being a, a, a head of a, a, a BU clearly um, got, gave me a lot of credibility. So coming in, the operating heads they all knew that I used to be one of them, and I walked a mile in their shoes, and that. That helped me a lot, and and on the business front, you know, having having a good understanding of the leverage of the company was was hugely beneficial. Um, where I had to play catch up was on the I, IT front, right? Catching up with the new technology, understanding uh, all the all the new trends and all the stuff that you know at the time virtualization was just getting hot and things. So I that was my curve. So I spent a lot of time on culture, but at night I was you know I was doing all kinds of reading and and getting up to speed on the technology. Right. Mike, I think I read someplace that you have got, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, about 8,000 people inside IT? Yeah, give or take. So how do, you, how do you transform? How did you go about taking that 8,000 group organization and bringing them forward from folks who in the past were focused very heavily on the technology and on technology metrics? And on budget metrics to evolving them to to focus on the business. How did you go about doing that? 
You know, there were a few there were a few key tricks, and and I, I sought out some help. So I did, you know, I did spend a lot of time, including you know, with people from Gartner, with with other areas. Um, what worked for me was a couple of things. One is um, I significantly flattened the organization, so there were a lot of layers in the organization, um, and that happens in technology organizations, right? You you tend to have low spans of control. You you know, you promote somebody to manager, um, but you're worried that they might not be a good manager because they're a technical guy. So you get one or two people reporting to them, and and next thing you know, you've got this kind of I formation of organization. What that leads to is distance between you, the CIO, and the and the client, the customer, the end the end customer, which in ADP's case is you know people like Bala who were trying to pay every uh, every two weeks, right? Um, so I collapsed the structure. I changed the span of controls, and I, and I got um, down to um, seven layers, which st still sounds like a lot with a big organization like 8,000. It's actually not that many. Hmm. Uh, second thing is uh, for all my senior leaders and for everybody. Mandate 20% um, of your time has to be with clients, um, so you have to get out there um, and spend time. And again, not clients with a little C, meaning internal people, but clients with a big C. You know, get out and talk to ADP customers about their experience with the ADP, and and again, figure out what we're trying to drive in terms of experience and, and client satisfaction. And then last, they changed all the incentives. So whereas the incentives all used to be on uh, tied to uptime and budgets and um, you can do a lot of weird things to maximize uptime and, and save money um, that may or may not align with what the business outcomes are. So we shifted all the incentives, particularly for the senior people, and now a huge percentage of the incentives are based on business performance, um, which hopefully IT is having some big influence on. Wow. I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit to what we talked about at the beginning of the show, which was ADP is the original cloud cloud provider. So could you give us a little bit of history behind ADP in the cloud? and how that has evolved during your five years as the head of IT at, at ADP. Sure. So, you know, the good news is um, I didn't have to preach the, the, the cloud uh, when I became, you know, head of, head of uh, IT. Became right. head of product development because we literally have been doing it for a long time. In fact, it was, it was strange to me, um, you know, when I, when I saw all these other companies marketing cloud. So if you go, if you rewind, you know, I mean, we started, I guess you would call it Service Bureau way back when, but the concept was literally the same, which is, you know, why would you have one computer on your premises processing payroll, right? You're not in the payroll business. We're in the payroll business, right? You're in the making widgets business. Go focus on what you should be focusing on. We'll take care of that. So you go back to that kind of Service Bureau model. Um, in the early 2000s, when, when, you know, things started shifting to the Internet, um, clearly, um, ADP recognized that trend, and we were doing internet-based, cloud, multi-tenant computing. Clients, you know, running their payrolls over the internet um, in browsers. You know, going going back, you know, 15 years now. Uh, and to us, it was it wasn't anything special. It, we just kind of viewed it as, well, of course, this is how you're going to do things. Why would you want to do this yourself? Why would you want to leverage the internet and the cloud? So I think we were kind of surprised when we saw other companies hyping this is something new because we thought it was just obvious. So how, what's, what have you seen as the evolution of the cloud then during this period of time? Well, you know, the good news is I think, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that evolution. I think you know, early in, you, you guys both know the, the trends. There are all these questions about can the cloud become mainstream, questions around security, you know, data, um, SLAs, et cetera. And, you know, the good news is I think we've crossed that. I think the providers today have proven that um, it is a viable means of, of doing business, and more and more CIOs have embraced the, the model. So I think those traditional peers have gone away. Um, I, I think you know now you're starting to see the extensions of it, right? So I think things that the cloud enables, you know, things like mobility, right? I think uh, cloud yeah. providers have absolutely provided a faster path for companies to get their employees mobile more more quickly, right? The next right. big wave you're going to see, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, is analytics and you know the ability to to leverage big data as cloud providers aggregate client information in, in a very safe and secure way, but in, in an anonymous way, but in a way that can drive big analytics. So I think, you know, all that is good. I think, you know, now now the, the, the cloud providers have an obligation. I think the next big wave is we have an obligation to make sure that we're easy to do business with and we integrate with each other very well. And I think a lot of the, the partnerships and things that you're seeing announced in the marketplace today are, are, are all about that, making sure we're doing business with customers the way we want to do business with us. Sure. We had uh, last week on our a couple of the Gilmore gang members, Steve Gilmore and John Tashek, and uh, I know before we went before we went live on the air, we talked about all of us uh, possibly attending Dreamforce, the Salesforce.com's event uh, up in next month, 
And John Tasher talked about Dreamforce is going to be all about a mobile experience. And you're going to see mobility and apps really interwoven through the entire theme of the conference. So talk to us. How has mobile uh, evolved and impacted your business? I think it's it's like everybody else, right? Um, there was a great article. Some of you may have seen it in the Wall Street Journal last week that talked about you know what was the biggest trend you know impacting um, you know technology and what 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 did you know rim in and what and it was all about it's about consumerism, right? It's about us. It's about me and you deciding this is how we want to work. You know we love this consumer experience and we want to bring it into work. That happened to us too. I mean you know so now um, people don't want to go to their PC. They they want everything on their mobile device. So we've had to. React. I'm very proud of the way we reacted. We were first to market with a number of innovations around mobile. So now um, you can pretty much get a, a very rich employee experience on a mobile device. Everything from payroll to benefits to time and labor. You know, all in an iPad or an iPhone. Um, but it's not going to stop. I mean, I think that that consumerism is going to keep continue to drive cloud providers, IT providers, and CIOs to provide that experience. Mike, we have a question from Twitter from Frank Scava, who is an industry analyst. And he asks, do you think it's harder for providers or, so, or vendors to have a business model, model that includes both subscription hmm. and license? Is that harder than doing one or the other? Good question. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, let me see if I can answer it this way. I am usually thankful that ADP has been in the recurring revenue subscription business since day one, uh, hmm. because I do think it's hard to, to manage both models. Um, I think you're seeing some of that in the market today. I think there's been some companies like Adobe that have been very, very successful in making the transition. Um, I think for some of the traditional premise-based providers, it's very hard, and it's all around culture of the company, how you manage your sales force, how you manage revenue streams, and how you manage investors as you make those transitions. Um, I think you're going to get there. I, I have a lot of colleagues at, at some of these big companies, and they, they, they have the right ideas. It's painful, though, so I'm blessed that, you know, 90, we have a 90% recurring revenue model. Every year, 90% of our revenue is um, in the bag just because we've got such a loyal client base that keeps coming back. Uh, that, that's so much nicer than having to prove your worth every quarter by hitting the big sales number. Well, it seems to me that this is it's basically a transition issue because we know that much of the industry is moving to the cloud. Of course, the cloud is not perfect for everybody. And so that means that for many of these companies at this moment in time, they have to maintain their existing customer base, plus look to the future, which is the cloud. So what do you see happening coming down the road? Do you, to, to, how do you see cloud growing, displacing traditional software, not displacing it? What do you, when you open a crystal ball, what do you see? I, it's clear to me. You know, I think the only thing that's unclear is, is the pace. But you know, I think cloud is absolutely going to displace premise-based um, applications. It already is, for the most part. You've, you've seen the success of some of the cloud providers. You know, there's there's this huge disruption to be to be had in the, in the market right now, and you know, companies are probably going to have to suffer through some you know some revenue cycles where this transition. You know, they're going to take a haircut on their maintenance revenues, on their on their on their cloud on their premise-based sales to make the transition and. Um, you know, again, I'll use Adobe as an example because I thought they did well in managing it. You know, you have to manage that with your investors and your um, and your shareholders and say, look, this is the right thing. It may hurt in the short run, but it's gonna it's gonna look beautiful in the long run. And I think that's right. I think that's what's gonna happen. We've talked about cloud. We've talked about mobile. I'm sure we'll talk about big data and analytics. But you are a social CIO. You're 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 on Twitter and social networks. ADP appears to be a social company. How does social computing collaboration in business impact innovation uh, in terms of processes and use of technology within ADP, and then how you service your customers? Uh, well, first, um, I appreciate the acknowledgement, Bala, from somebody as prolific as you in terms of you know social and blogging and Twitter. You know, to, to be acknowledged by you is is, uh, is great. Uh, uh, I wish I, I wish I was better at it. It's something that I, I, I need to I need to work on a little bit. My my social presence. Uh, what's clear to me, though, is social is, is becoming really pervasive, right? And it started where it started with most consumer companies, which is in the, the service aspect, right? So taking care of your brand, starting to manage uh, client feedback and, and, and cases and questions through social. You know, and we, we do a lot of that. We've got tools to manage that and integrate into our CRM systems. But the really fun part right now, the really interesting part for me is um, how social use cases are now um, embedding themselves in our business, right? So 
Um, we're seeing social use cases everywhere in the human capital management space. It started with kind of the obvious use case, which is recruiting, right? So I'm looking for somebody. I want my recruiting tools to integrate to LinkedIn and some of the other boards out there, and and um, and also leverage Facebook and and, and networks. And so that, that's great. And you know, we've all done that. But think about the power of social in other areas of of, of human capital management. You know, the example we always use is. Um, you know, like shift changes in restaurants. Like you have people working in restaurants, somebody wants to give up their shift, you know, what do they do? They call their friends, they call their manager. Well, now you just tweet it, you know, you just tweet it, somebody responds. Well, if you can integrate that into your back end time and labor systems and start, you know, start surfacing up data through social channels, um, you know, it'll, it'll just make life easier for everybody involved. And so we're working on all kinds of social use cases like that, onboarding people, you know, you hear the horror stories about people getting onboarded into a company that's been the first three months trying to figure out what's going on. Right, social right. can play a huge role in that. So I could go on and on about this topic. Have you used social technologies to recruit talent into your IT organization or something you're considering using? I, absolutely. We, in fact, uh, you know, great use case right now. We're opening up, um, uh, we have something called ADP Labs, um, and we're opening up a, a, a leg of that in New, in New York City over here in Chelsea. Um, and I would say that the vast majority of our recruiting efforts have been focused on social. We're looking for very specific types of people, you know, data scientists and user experience experts, design experts, and um, that's where they're found. That's where you find them. That's excellent. The, uh, the nature of ADP's business requires really intense collaboration and partnership with your company. So how does that feed into your corporate culture? Or another way of asking it is, that emphasis on collaboration. What is it? What kind of corporate culture is needed? How does it? How do they feed on each other? You know, the, the it, it's another good news story in that you know when you think about how ADP has been set, successful, you know, going all the way back to when the company was founded. You know, literally, um, you know, uh, an accountant uh, named Henry Staub in a in a garage in Patterson, New Jersey, an apartment over a garage rather in Patterson, New Jersey, or an ice cream shop. Um, doing payroll, you know, just doing general ledgers and payroll for people. Um, but it's all about mutually um, successful outcomes, right? So partnering with clients to get the right outcome. Um, and that, that kind of dominates our culture in terms of how we, how we work at ADP. Um, it's all about the outcome, and it's not about um, who, you know, who, who has what authority. In fact, what I like to tell people when I interview them or when I hire them is, you know, your personal capital inside of ADP, again, it's not... It's not your budget or how big your organization is. It's how many people would say, you know, I know Mike Capone. I've worked with him in ADP either as a um, as a client or as an associate in the company, and he's helped me be successful. But that's how we measure people's capital inside the company. Uh, you come from a, a family of CIOs, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Your father was a was a CIO, and you know, how has the role of the CIO? changed over time. If you, I, I can tell you, again, coming just from a show at Interop where his, historically it was all about technology and getting into the architecture in bits and bytes, there was an entire emphasis on enhancing the business acumen. And it may be because of this discussions about chief digital officer and CMOs having uh, more influence on tech spend. How has the role changed, and what advice would you give to CIOs, new CIOs, who are uh, who are responsible for shaping their IT organization? Uh, it's changed. Uh, it's changed a lot. I am a second generation um, CIO. Not. I don't know if it was by choice or by influence. I was talking <laughs> to Michael before. You know, we both went to liberal arts schools. I think I was I was rebelling a little bit. You know, when I was growing <laughs> up. Uh, but my father very wise man, he wanted to make sure I was employable, so he said, <laughs> you know, you, you, you go go to liberal arts school, right. take as much history class as you want, but you're taking a computer science degree because, you know, I don't want you to live with me forever, so. <laughs> very um, smart man. And <laughs> as usual, you know, as in almost every case in life, he's right. You know, he was right. It worked out okay for me in the end, um, although I do think the liberal arts thing helped me, you know, with business and be more articulate. You know, how the role has changed, I mean, I remember, you know, so my father was uh, one of the first people to carry the title of CIO and he worked for the retail JC Penney company. Right. And um, you know, I remember technology being big breakthrough for them. They were getting into the catalog business, right? And it used to be, you know, over the phone, very manual based. And he, he people thought he was crazy at the time. He stood up these data centers, he put in data networks and linked everything together. He had this high availability thing. So if one data center wasn't working, they could route all the catalog works to another one. And he was really pioneering. 
um, in that in that regard. And I think, um, but that kind of that wave of IT was really IT for IT. It was like technology um, in a silo doing what technology does. And, and clearly, the CIO today is um, as as platform, you know, and cloud and you know, it, infrastructure as a service becomes more pervasive. It's going to go away. You know, you're not the engineer anymore. That you're not cobbling it together. And it really is, um, you know, the the relationship you have with the other leaders in the business. The the chief marketing officer is a good example. But I would argue everybody who has a senior staff or operating job had better be your confidant, your best friend, because ultimately your 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 whole currency inside the company is going to be how do you how do you light them up and make them successful. And um, that that does not involve very often engineering. That involves good business acumen coupled with technology savvy and a good awareness of the industry. You know, recently I was talking with the CIO of one of the largest companies in the country, and I and I won't say who it is. Well, they make airplanes, so you can take your guess. Um, <laughs> and he said to me that he spends. We were talking about this issue. He said he spends 80% of his time with the folks in the business. How does that mirror your experience and what you do? Yeah, I would say uh, easily that's the case. And you know, again, I try to carve out 20% of my time to deal with clients outside of the company. Um, and then the rest of my time is literally spent, 80% is probably not a bad number in terms of aggregate um, with senior leadership, um, with sales, um, with marketing. Um, I really, quite honestly, don't spend uh, lots and lots of time on things like infrastructure and. Um, and operations. I mean, I've hired really good people who take care of that stuff for me. I mean, I expect them to, um, but but really, the strategy part is is the most important part. And I think you know the the good news is that at least at ADP, and I know this is um, this is back now. We went through a wave of CIOs reporting to CFOs and um, during you know, kind of financial downturn. But I think the CIO, a senior strategist reporting to the CEO, having a seat at the table is back in fashion, and I'm really glad because I think that's where it should be. So that so you report to the CEO of the company? I do. Is there a chief digital officer at ADP? You know, we don't have the official title. We tend to uh, we tend to not throw the C title around too much, um, right. but we do have somebody who's head of digital for us, um, and he is a superstar. We we love the guy to death, um, and he's driving a lot of our strategy right now. Both you know both you know kind of our digital marketing efforts, but even our efforts to make our Workforce more digital savvy, right? Leverage social and and right. get digital more pervasive in everything we do. Where do you think uh, digital initiatives should sit? Is it in marketing is it in IT? Um, should it be a virtual team with different stakeholders that are actively shaping? Because ultimately, when we talk mobile, social, cloud, data, it should be all aimed towards improving the user experience. That user, whether it's the employee, the business partner, or the customer. So. Who owns the shaping the experience, and then perhaps even the, the budget to, to, to bring all of that to fruition? Uh, you know, my experience has been um, you know we're, we're pretty uh, non-parochial about where stuff reports. Um, in our case, that that, that reports into marketing. Um, the, the the honest answer is good people trump you know bad organization structure every time, right? So um, <laughs> well, you need to, as long as you've got a highly collaborative. Culture, it, it doesn't really matter, and here it, it doesn't really matter. You know, there's there's obviously plenty that reports to me, uh, but there, there's plenty that doesn't report to me, um, and it, it it works just like it it does. And and you know, in, in the same regard, all of my R and D leadership um, that supports all of our business units, um, they report to me, but they're all embedded in the business unit, so they actually sit with operating operational leaders in whatever geography they're in, and um, and. Like we, we spend zero time on more stuff reports. We spend lots of time on effectiveness and are we getting desired outcomes and where can we where can we be better? That's excellent. That's excellent. I'd like to just say to everybody that we're talking with Mike Capone, who is the CIO of we can say a huge cloud provider, ADP. And if you have questions for him, send them in using the hashtag CXO talk. Mike, a lot of times uh, when CIOs get together, the conversation ends up being about tech details rather than the business. I, I personally think that that's an issue, but well, what does that say to you about the state of how of the CIO mindset in general today? You know, maybe we're running in, in different circles because, I mean, I, I do see some of that, um, but more and more, you know, I belong to a large-cap CIO group here in, in, in the New York metro area, and, and more and more 
conversations I'm having have been around around outcomes. Some of it, you know, some of it is just around trends and things we're wrestling with. I think we all, you know, look at each other and say, "What are you doing about this consumerization thing?" And how do we, you know, how do we wrestle with devices and things like that? But most of it's really around driving driving outcomes. And I really have seen a discernible shift in mentality among CIOs over the last couple of years, away from bits and bytes and technical uh, to um, you know to more of an outcome focused um, kind of mindset. Um, it's really interesting because I, 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 you know, I talk to two or three CIOs of clients a week typically, and I, I actually got one on the phone the other day who, was, who said, "I'm not doing cloud. Uh, you know, it has to be in my data center. I'm not giving it up, etc." And I thought to myself, "Wow, I haven't heard that in like two years. Like I, I literally, so that tells me that it's, it's good. There's still people who are holding on to the old paradigm, but I do think that the mindset is changing." We have had a number of startup. CEOs as our guests. Uh, both Michael and I love talking to, you know, companies that are trying to disrupt the marketplace, and we've had some exceptional CEOs of startups. And so my question to you is, um, do you work with startups? And and if if you do, what advice do you have to startup CEOs or or you know startup leaders that that want to work with ADP? How should they approach you? What what do you what do you look for in order to judge that, you know, although they're a small, maybe less established organization, this is a company that ADP should do business with? Yeah, you know, we do work. We do work with startups. Um, we've acquired a few startups over the years. Um, you know, the, the thing I'd say about ADP is, um, you know, we, we like we're we're very innovative, but our best asset remains our brand, right? We are we are the trusted partner out there in the marketplace. You don't pay. 33 million people every payday, one in six people in the U.S., and not not you know have that trust with your clients. So when we look when we look to partner, we always look for you know what do what service are you trying to deliver, and you know are, can you be part of this portfolio of trusted providers that that we bring to our, our clients. I mean then from that it's you know what what problem are you trying to solve. Um, you should see the stuff that gets brought to me um, sometimes <laughs> around you know what you know this is how we're gonna you know this is how we're gonna do performance reviews of people, or this new way of thinking, and it's like, okay, and I'll, I'm sure I'm going to miss one one day, but um, you know, we've got to be relevant. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to be relevant um, in, terms of, in terms of what services you're providing. Um, so relevance and trust are probably the two things that matter to me most. How often do startups pitch to you? Uh, you know, I probably get one or two a month. Wow. Wow. I'll get about 50 of them next week in HR Tech. <laughs> right, right. That's right. Big conference coming up. Excellent. You must get an endless number of larger vendors pitching you too, endlessly. Um, yeah, you know we, we do. We're um, you know I mean obviously we're a big cloud provider, so I've got um, you know I've got a fairly large IT infrastructure budget. Uh, so you know I, just like all CIOs, I, I have I have lots of friends you know particularly around the end of the quarter you know the end of the end of the year. Um, so I, we have those relationships as well, and then um, you know and then we also have companies who are coming to us. Um, wanting to partner, um, you know, again, we're we're kind of a nice company to partner with. We have 600,000 clients, and we're pretty pervasive in the in the business world. So a lot of people like to like our distribution and our our model. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with uh, CMO at ADP and how you work together to um, to 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 make sure that the marketing organization is successful? Certainly, as I look at my own. You know, uh, innovation roadmap. Um, really, just about every investment in marketing uh, touches technology, and and uh, so I I have heavy dependence on IT and and my my relationship with our with our CIO. Uh, any advice you have in terms of how to collaborate with the head of marketing and maybe some uh, you know specific experiences within ADP. Sure, you know, and it's interesting. Literally, like an hour before um, this this uh, call, we uh, just got announced a new CMO, so we have a new uh, a new one as our previous one moved into a different role. Um, oh, wow. but, yeah. So, but I'm um, I'm really excited because he's 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 a great guy. Um, you know, the relationship with marketing it traditionally has been very very strong at ADP. I mean, you know, the um, not only just enablement of things like you know tools and technology sure. and, and you know that that stuff just just works, but you know this thing, you know, called analytics and big data, is really, I think, where 
the rubber is going to meet the road in terms of CMOs and, and, and CIOs working together. Um, you guys probably see some of the work we do um, at ADP. You know, we, we put out um, uh, statistics. Like, we put out the National Employment Report, which, by the way, is the only game in town thanks to the government shutting down. If you want to know what's going on in the job market, the only people you can ask is ADP right now, um, which we, we don't like the government shutting down, but we like the fact that we can provide such a good service to the, to the country right now. Um, but, you know, we're doing more and more on analytics, and it really, um, it really demonstrates the power of our brand, right? The fact that, you know, we not only have had this data, but we're, we're using it um, for good services like the National Employment Report. We're now putting out re reports on healthcare reform and the impact of in the workforce. Um, as, as technologists and, and as CIOs um, helping to drive business outcomes, being, being there with the, the CMO and being able to help them answer the questions about um, the brand, the services, the things we can provide, and what we can do with the information that we have at our fingertips is critical. And, and the only other thing I'd say is keep an open mind, right? Because they're, you know, they, they get paid to be a little bit out there, you know, marketing right. people, you want them to be out there. And um, sometimes they say things, you're like, really? Like, what made you think of that? But the reality is that they, have, they get it sometimes, and, and you got to go with them. And I'm really happy that we've gone with them on, uh, particularly on this big data journey, because they were out in front of a long time ago saying, hey, maybe we should, maybe we, you know, who would have thought, maybe we should publish a report that would, you know, be in addition to the government survey numbers, the BLS numbers, you know, BLS has got 2,000 people working on this survey, right. we're going to do this, like way back when, I'm sure when the marketing person brought that up, and I was like, are you nuts, like why would we do that, and it turned <laughs> out to be a fantastic thing, and IT and big data powered that. Absolutely. You know, I think for for many organizations, this notion of working together, IT working together seamlessly for the business, breaks down in practice, especially for smaller organizations where the CIO might be a very creative, innovative person, but is working within a context that does not view IT that way. It views IT in the older traditional way. What advice do you have for that CIO who's creative, who wants to innovate, hmm. and is just having a hard time fighting the tide of oppression, <laughs> of CIO <laughs> oppression? Yeah, I, I, I know some of those CIOs. Um, it's, you know, it, definitely, it definitely can be um, a daunting task. Um, for me, it's you know today's world. It's all about it's a show me kind of culture, right? Um, you know, I would say that um, a lot of the innovation that we've driven um, has been, you know, started out as incubation, um, and and then you know got to a point where we're ready to to shell it. You know, mobile started that way. And, you know, believe it or not, I didn't necessarily have huge broad buy-in on on mobile, but when we delivered the first app without really you know any big budget or anything around it. People were impressed, and that you know that gave us permission to take it to the next level. And now, hell, we're spending more money on mobile than we're spending on a lot of other things. Um, the, you know, the other thing that, that I, I I did, and you know, was I stood up a lab. I just I said, you know what, like as long as we got everybody focused on the day to day, the the latest deliverable, the latest deadline, the latest product release, we're never going to think about anything new. So we do have something called ADP Labs, which is here in our corporate HQ, but now also in New York City, that's focused on. Um, incubating, incubating new ideas, and it's a modest investment in the grand scheme of things, but it's driven a lot of great stuff that I probably wouldn't have got to if I had just stayed in the in the day-to-day -day routine. When I when I think of collaboration in, in in business, and you know, I think I just read a Brian Solis he labeled it Generation Connected, Generation C, where you know there's this hyper-connected knowledge sharing ecosystem and. Uh, people are comfortable collaborating. We in our company have been using uh, even CRM uh, tools and 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 uh, Salesforce Chatter to collaborate within the business. When you think about managing talent and 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 growing professionals and trying to understand judgment, experience, and influence, can big data and analytics around the social activities within business help guide? Talent management is, is ADP working on, you know, understanding unstructured data and social analytics to determine, uh, you know, uh, fast trackers within business and and talent ma management. That's uh, a great, it's a great question, Bala. So the answer is definitively yes, without a doubt. So you know, we've kind of conquered the traditional talent management, you know, succession planning, um, competency yeah. management, you know, all those. All those things are out there. We've got a beautiful cloud-based solution that, that helps companies manage their talent. 
Uh, and, um, and but the problem is the, the world has changed, right? And you know the days of the traditional performance appraisal, the days of the you know the annual 360. We all love those, right? You know your boss, your peers, your employees. They get the survey once a year, and depending on how grumpy you were the last couple of weeks, you know you may you may or may not get a good good survey back. Um, the reality is, you and I and Michael, we're getting we're getting feedback all around us every minute of every day, right? Like people are tweeting right now. People will tweet after this on. You know, this show, how did we do? Did you like the host? Did you like the guest? Um, every meeting I go to an ADP, someone said, boy, that was a great meeting with Mike, or that was a less great meeting with Mike. Um, that was an hour of time I wish I could have gotten back in my life. You know, those are, that feedback's <laughs> out there, right? So the, the ability to capture that 360 view, not once a year, but every minute of every day is really where the world is going, right? This, this concept of the social 360. And um, so our next generation of tools, and we've got some stuff in Pilot right now, is really focused on, on capturing sentiment and feedback, you know, pretty much real time versus you know once a year when you know it can be biased or influenced. I, I have a uh, comment that has just come in on Facebook, and this is uh, from Bob Warfield, who is a great entrepreneur. And he, he's commenting on this discussion we had earlier about managing an on-premise and subscription uh, business model simultaneously in one company. Listen to what he has to say. He's not mincing words here. He says, and I'm quoting on Facebook, the two models are toxic to one another. I've seen it up close and personal. <laughs> impossible to align sales. Impossible to wean the executive staff off the accelerated revenue of on-prem when they're trying to make the quarter. They want to make the quarter with on-prem. Uh, they want to make the quarter with on-prem, then give the rest a subscription. Unfortunately, customers just don't work that way. So Frank Scavo is saying it doesn't work. Any any thoughts on that? It's, he's taking a pretty extreme position. I'm sorry, yeah, Bob Warfield was saying Bob Warfield, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a heavy yeah. topic for a Friday afternoon. I'm I just, know, I just I, yeah, I just want. But I know this is what came in. On Come on, I can smell the weekend right now. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, look, look, bring, you know, bring it. I think, um, uh, you know, I think that's kind of what I said without, you know, just in a much more politically correct way, right? I mean, there's a reason why I work where I work because I believe in our model and things like that. What I, it, it, there, there's huge conflicts. There's no doubt, and you know, I mean, I think most most of your listeners know that. Um, the question really is, can you make the transition or not? It may be, um, because I, I do agree there's a big conflict in it right now, and, and I, I've seen it in our vendors and our partners. Can companies make the transition or not? And I'm going to take the position right now that I think they can make the make the transition. The good ones can make the, can and will make the transition. Not all of them. Some of them are going to some are going to fall fall over flat. Some of them better get their stuff together, or they're going to fall over flat soon. But I think I think you'll see it happen. And um, but yeah, no doubt, no doubt that it's it's ugly and confusing. This transition is going to be painful. But it is a transition. We are in a transition time. Yeah, sure. We're, we're in a transition. Look, if everybody could wave their magic wand and say, "Up oh, next month, I'm going all recurring," I think that would be all subscription. <laughs> I think that would be that would be great. It's just a lot of companies don't have that that luxury. Yeah, true. You know, we're almost out of time, but before we go. Uh, you mentioned, we, we've spoken a little bit about mobile and social and analytics and big data. When you survey the entire landscape of the, the activities in which you're involved, what grabs you the most? What's most interesting, most exciting? What gets you out of bed the most, most exciting? You know, it's going to be cliche, Michael, but it's, um, to me, it is, it's the data and the analytics. You know, I mean, I, I'm... I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I hate the term big data as much as I hate the term cloud, right? I mean, it's just, I, I think people have been doing big data for a long time. But, you know, I do think the currency of the future is going to be data. I don't think it's going to be dollars or euros or anything else. I think it's he who has the most data is going to, and uses that data correctly, just like, just like capital, is going to win. And um, the things that we're able to do, you know, as, as a society um, and at an ADP is in a microcosm, um, are just amazing, you know, the, the trends that we're seeing, the information that we can share, and our ability to deliver goods and services and things to people in a much more personalized way, I think, is going to be the way of the future. So that, to me, is what gets me really fired up uh, at the end of the day. I think this is also great advice to CMOs. If you're not data-driven, um, you're not going to be, you're not going to survive as a, as a marketing officer. In fact, any line of business, all executives, all leaders need to be able to, uh, you know, take the data, 
uh, obtain insight uh, that leads to rapid decisions and actions and ultimately deliver value to your customers and your employees. You have to go through that entire cycle to stay relevant. So that's great, great advice from Mike. And actually, Bala, I have a question for you as a CMO. OK, I thought we were out of time. And uh... <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> I think we have a couple of minutes. Uh, not much. So as a, as a CMO, wouldn't it be true to say that it's really the CIO that should be in the driver's seat and sort of above the CMO? <laughs> as a CMO, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that you cannot be a successful CMO without strong partnership with the CIO. That's when, again, uh, you know, when I think about all of the initiatives that are driving and transforming our own company's marketing uh, organization, I would not be successful without a strong IT organization, not only supporting but co-creating value with me. So it really, so so the magic does happen. And obviously, I'm being facetious. No. The magic happens when the two come together with some measure of equality. I, I, all future marketing hires, or vast majority, will be skill sets of, of a journalist and a technologist. And, and, and the technologist element would be some folks that can understand and translate data into something meaningful. Because again, in uh, the, the, this whole social era that we live in, uh, peer influence is critically important. And ability to deliver a relevant message with the right context requires you to understand your customers well. And I don't see how you can do that without being data driven. And that's where the technologists and specifically CIOs and IT come into play. Actually, I think that's where both sides both sides need these complementary skills in order to maintain relevance for their organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow, the 47 minutes, it, wow. it, it just flew by. Mike, you were awesome. Yes, uh, thank you were so really great. <laughs> so we've been talking with Mike Capone, who is the CIO of ADP, uh, an enormous company, an enormous cloud provider. And Mike, I think it's fair to say, although your title is CIO, in fact, you're equal part business person and technologist. For sure. For sure. That's the goal. And I want to thank everybody for joining. Vala, as always, great show. Absolutely Thanks, Michael. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and uh, and I'd like to invite everybody to come again next week. We're going to have a great show then too. And thanks so much. And a big thank you to Mike Capone from ADP. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Mike. Thank you both. I enjoyed my time with you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye.